Hi, my name is Beverly Kundell, and I would like to welcome you to National Mortgage Professional Magazine's webinar titled, Your Checklist for ABM Compliance, sponsored and presented by Vero's Real Estate Solutions. I would like to thank all of our webinar attendees for taking the time out of their busy day for this very valuable and informative webinar in our ongoing series of webinars. I would especially like to thank today's webinar sponsor and presenter, Vero's Real Estate Solutions. Bureau's Real Estate Solutions provides essential tools for comprehensive property valuation and risk assessment to mortgage lenders, servicers, rating agencies, and the investment community, both private and government sponsored. Innovating mortgage technology since 2001, Bureau's continues to hold a leading role in the mortgage industry's collateral valuation space. Bureau's has excelled as a premium provider of automated valuation models, ABMs, and as a thought, thought leader in the field of mortgage analytics. We are lucky enough to have three presenters for today's webinar, Lee Kennedy, David Rasmussen, and Michael Coyne. Lee Kennedy is the CEO and Managing Director of AV Metrics and is a highly sought after industry expert in the testing and use of AVMs and is a recognized authority on current AVM regulations and guidelines. Since 2005, AV Metrics has provided independent testing, validation, and auditing of automated valuation models along with technical and subject matter expertise. Kennedy's guidance has helped several helped numerous lenders select and utilize commercially available AVM products in a safe and prudent manner for collateral risk assessment, evaluation, and fraud analysis. The company has a long established history of independence and transparency and a solid reputation among regulatory bodies for providing strong and reliable compliance direction to AVM users. David Rasmussen is the Senior Vice President of Operations for Vero's Real Estate Solutions and is an expert in collateral valuation and automated valuation technologies. He is responsible for the operational logistics of Vero's multiple valuation, analytic, and system strategies. Over the course of more than 15 years in the industry, Rasmussen has played an influential role in shaping the use of mortgage-related enterprise risk management systems and collateral valuation services. Michael Coyne is the Manager of Collateral Process at AV Metrics. With more than 20 years' experience as a real estate appraiser, Coyne's experience has a broad and progressive path in the collateral valuations industry. Working for large institutional lenders, he has held positions from production staff appraiser to national valuation process and policy management positions. Coyne's primary focus is in the development and implementation of collateral evaluation policies and procedures fee appraiser panel development, and processes related to the use of automated valuation models. Before I turn the webinar over to our presenters, I would like to conduct a brief poll to assess your experience with AVMs. So I'm going to put the first poll question up on the screen, and if you could just uh, respond accordingly, I'll give you a few minutes to answer, actually a few seconds rather, and then we will discuss the results. So the first question is, how familiar are you with AVMs? And the choice is expert, I'm responsible for testing, and just here to make sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Intermediate, fairly knowledgeable, but have more to learn. Novice, have some entry-level knowledge and looking to learn as well. Or beginning, here to learn what an AVM is. And I'm just going to give you about five more seconds to answer. Okay, and I'm going to close that poll, and I'm going to share the results with you. So 7% of you said you were an expert, 41% said intermediate, 39% said novice, and 13% said beginning. So hopefully by the end you'll all be experts. That's our goal here. Okay, we're going to go to our next question right now. We have two more for you. The next one is, my organization uses AVMs, and the choices are routinely, occasionally, we like to use them, but not sure how or when, or never. Let me give you about five more seconds on this one. Okay, I'm going to close that poll and share the results with you. 
So 45% of you said routinely, 30% said occasionally, 14% said we'd like to use them but not sure how or when, and 11% said never. Okay, and we're going to do our last poll question now. And that is, what I'm most hoping to learn from this webinar is, and the choices are info on what AVMs are and how to use them, info on the regulations, guidance on what I should be doing to be compliant, or a confirmation I'm on the right track. All right, another five seconds for this one. Okay, and we're closing that one, and we'll share the results for that. 27% said info on what AVMs are and how to use them. 28% said info on the regulations. 29% said guidance on what I should be doing to be compliant. And 15% said confirmation I'm on the right track. So we're pretty evenly split among the first three choices. Okay, so without any further ado, I would like to move on to our presentation and like to turn this over to David Rasmussen. Okay, thank you, Beverly. So this is the discussion points that we're going to be covering today. So uh, we have a number of slides, so we're going to have to go through them rather quickly. But we're going to start off by just talking a little bit about uh, AVMs, give you a little background there. Then we're going to move into the current landscape and specifically the regulatory environment. And then we're going to end with a five-point checklist and specifically looking at AVMs and, and how they can and should be used. So now, if you look at AVMs, we're going to give you a quick background uh, and uh, catch us up on uh, the current environment as well. Uh, this will provide the, the background necessary to, to continue that larger conversation with the regulatory and the checklist. So as you look at the, this slide and consider the dramatic improvements in technology over the last 10 to 15 to 20 years, AVMs are no different. So early AVMs were primarily fighting for the large lenders. Uh, the large lenders uh, in their use of AVMs would identify and use one specific AVM company and sign a contract with them. And then in certain circumstances, they would set up a supplementary uh, AVMs on a smaller scale, smaller contracts. But primarily, the AVM vendors were going after the big guys because the big guys would go through the testing and uh, would, go, uh, would uh, use the AVMs appropriately. Then what would happen is you'd get into the mid-size and the small lenders that would, again, for the most part, have to take the word of the AVM providers. But as you look at the, uh, the, the, what data consisted of or what consisted in these AVMs in the early days, um, data for the most part was limited to public records. The methodology was somewhat simplistic, but uh, over the years different modeling techniques started to be incorporated. Early AVMs uh, started off in the indexing world and then they moved into the sedonic world and, and then over the years they kind of got a little more sophisticated. Uh, 10 to 15 years ago the hardware had its limitations. Clearly just back in that time it had certain hardware capabilities. And as I mentioned before, testing uh, took place the largest lenders, but not a whole lot of testing took place with mid-sized lenders or smaller lenders or, or uh, other companies along those lines. Now, as you consider today's AVMs, it's an entirely different world. Now, most AVM users, and there's a good portion of the, the industry that uses AVMs, um, will use some type of multiple AVM approach. And these, these have different names. So you'll hear them referred to as cascades or waterfall techniques or pick right strategies or model preference tables. But the idea here is you want to identify which AVM is optimal to use in a specific situation. And so in a specific geographic area, so for example, a county, uh, maybe a property type, uh, you'll go through the testing, you'll identify which is the appropriate AVM to be in the first position and take the first approach valuing that property and then build rules around that. If it didn't meet those rules, it'll roll over to the next one and the next one and, and then go from there. So that's primary um, the use of AVMs today. The cascades and, and, and preference tables have really taken over quite a bit. Um, now there's numerous data sources. And back in, again, in years past, it used to be primarily public records. Now it's supplemented by a host of different data types. There's uh, MLS data, there's REO data that's taken in consideration in AVMs to identify specific markets. Uh, there's pipeline sources depending on maybe if you're a GSE and you have different appraisal sources you can utilize. 
if you have an AVM, there's, there's, there's multiple data sources that are available today, much more than have existed in years past. And then the frequency of updates within the models has taken place on a more, much more consistent basis as well. And that gets into the hardware, which is listed a little uh, further down. But also, also the methodology, the indexing, the hedonic, the combination models, the neural net. Now you're looking at multiple index models, multiple in, uh, hedonic models, different combinations of these, uh, these models, these blended approaches that, get take, that take place in, in this valuation approach. So instantaneously, you have 10 to 15 or so possible different approaches going into any one AVM response. And that's provided by the upgraded hardware, faster processors, more storage space, a greater ability to do testing and due diligence, which takes us into that testing bullet as well. So the internal due diligence that the AVM vendors are doing today is, is significant. And it's usually available upon non-disclosure agreements, and, and the AVM providers will make that available to any prospect or, or customer that they have. In addition to that, uh, what's much more prevalent in today's market is the uh, external testing, whether that's direct testing with specific lenders, the large lenders, uh, mid-sized lenders are doing much more testing these days, and then also third-party uh, independent um, companies as well are going through and providing this independent testing perspective. And as you go into the next slide, back in 2004, I was uh, speaking on a panel uh, talking specifically about AVMs. And uh, one of the participants brought up this slide, which is identified to the left, and made the comments, the appraisals are the gold standard and nothing else compares. And while there's still some that uh, will hold the same viewpoint today, most take an objective view that all valuation approaches have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. And this includes appraisals. Appraisals are great. Uh, AVMs are great. But the idea is to test them and know them and know what the, what the strengths and weaknesses are and use them appropriately. So as you look at today, what we're looking at is the multiple valuation approaches, and this is just three of them here. So you have AVMs, BPOs, and appraisals. All of them have strengths and weaknesses. The idea is to know and study them in such a way that you know where you can apply them and what's the most efficient and cost-effective way without incurring additional risk. And that's some of the things we'll be talking about today, but that's some of the things we'll go through in maybe another webinar discussion where we can get through into details of testing procedures. So as you go through the AVM usage, years past it was primarily driven by quality assurance, maybe some reviews. As uh, appraisals came in, it was very easy and still is to order a quick appraisal, uh, sorry, quick uh, AVM to check the uh, data provided in the appraisal as well as the, as well as the valuation information provided. Um, in portfolio analysis on batch runs when you have hundreds or hundreds of thousands of properties, instead of running a simple sample of that uh, file, it's very easy and um, immediate to be able to run you know, thousands of properties at any given point, and it's cost effective as well. And home equity has always been an early adopter of AVMs, and they continue to use AVMs today. So if you look over on the right-hand side, um, I have first mortgages listed here. I don't know that uh, AVMs are used to fund uh, origination loans uh, significantly. In fact, I, I'm sure they're not. Uh, they are used in the QC process, though. Uh, for first and second, for home equities, um, for pre-origination, for marketing purposes, identifying LTVs and, and uh, specific areas that the lender would like to do more loan uh, lending business in. Um, gets back into the portfolio analysis, which we have listed here, and then there's a host of hybrid valuation products that are also available. And then finally, as we go to the next slide, we go through the strengths and the weaknesses of AVMs. And just to quickly summarize, uh, AVMs have speed, um, they're almost immediate as you run the, run the value. They're objective, um, non-biased. Literally, when you run an AVM, you're inserting an address and no other information. So it's going through its, its own proprietary calculations and valuing that property and then uh, providing the result. They're inexpensive. Um, as mentioned before, they're um, consistent and uh, highly measurable. So over months and years, AVMs have been um, improving significantly as far as their accuracy, as far as their performance, and we've seen that consistency on a, on a go-forward basis, especially over the last couple of years with everything I mentioned before, the ability to go through and identify uh, specific uh, values on a consistent basis and have that accuracy, um, we're, we're, we're really well down that path. Um, a, w a couple of few, few weaknesses, uh, they cannot c confirm or deny a property exists. 
Uh, they're not going to verify the condition of the property because literally nobody is looking at that property. It's using the data that's available. And then, um, but the next point is we will not provide or produce a result in an area with data limitations. In some way, this is a strength um, because rather than generating a value on a property and, and, and going down a path where a property may be a more, little more difficult and inappropriate for an AVM to render a value, it's nice that uh, it just simply comes back with a non-hit non or a non-appropriate uh, evaluation at that point. And then finally, it cannot uh, account for influence factors in surrounding market areas, such as railroad tracks, freeways, those kind of things. It does take it into consideration for the local market as it values the property, but it's not going to take it, uh, again, specific adjustments. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide. I'll turn the time over to Mike, who will elaborate on the regulatory landscape and a little bit of uh, the history as well. Thank you, David. Now we want to take a look at uh, you know the, the current landscape of things. A uh, quick slide here, uh, you know, on the history and some of the uh, the guidance and the documents that have helped to shape the industry and helped to shape uh, ABMs themselves and the use of ABMs, uh, starting back in the 70 to 80 uh, timeline. Uh, CAMA stands for Computer Assisted Mass Appraisal. Uh, you know, the foundation, the roots of, of most of these models lie with the assessors trying to determine a way that they could uh, value properties in a short time frame uh, across their entire footprint. And as it moved from uh, the public domain into private use and private enterprise, uh, these uh, regulatory institutions, uh, regulatory oversight groups get involved. You see, um, I won't touch on all of these, obviously, but uh, 1994, Thrift Bolton 55 was uh, the original sort of uh, AVM uh, guidance. It's now been superseded by 2010-42. Uh, uh, so moving along, I want to you know, focus all the way over on the right side. As David mentioned, we're going to you know, move through these slides fairly quickly, but it's, I think it's important to understand the history and, and where the landscape began. Uh, 2009, you've got your Home Valuation Code of Conduct and your H.R. 1728, which was the anti-predatory bill, which passed the House and died in the Senate. But both of those are precursors and have a lot of content uh, relative to the Dodd-Frank Act, which you see listed there as H.R. 4173, and also the interagency guidance. Again, you see listed there as 2010-42. So those precursors, if you really want to consider yourself an expert um, by virtue of that uh, poll we did earlier, you should probably be familiar with a lot of these documents. Um, but for those of us in the in novice and intermediate levels that um, you know, are, are comfortable enough focusing on the right side of this, of this timeline, uh, you can use the others as your uh, insomnia cure. Um, so I want to focus, um, begin with uh, the Interagency guidance, which is um, probably the most influential uh, guidance that's out there now in, in shaping our landscape and determining the use of, of AVMs. Uh, this was originally drafted in 2008 and, and, and released to the public for comment. Um, it was enhanced and worked over over that two-year period, and then the release of the guidance, not until 2010, but was sort of coordinated uh, to ensure that there was no conflicts and that it was uh, consistent with uh, the content in the Dodd-Frank Act. A uh, lot of moving parts, a lot of interdependencies in the different sections relating to uh, appraisal guidance. Again, it's the appraisal and evaluation guidance. Um, encourage everyone to be familiar with all of these sections. Uh, they're all very important and if we eliminate it, uh, or don't cover one of the or some of the bullet points here today, it's only for the focus of our time frame and not to diminish their, their importance. So um, I've picked out a few of the sections, the titles here that I want to go over and further uh, reduce them down to just a few bullet points within those titles that I feel are really pertinent and on point for today's time frame and for today's discussion. Um, Title IV, uh, which is the first section, actually back up for me, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that on this slide. Um, so Title IV, which is the first title that really delves into any specific guidance following the, the introductory and background sections of this guidance, um, appraisal and evaluation program. And you'll hear me probably use the term program a lot 
as I talk here today. Uh, the guidance really emphasizes uh, an overall holistic program. Uh, these tools, AVMs and these evaluation tools and, and technical tools, um, they're not, you know, a standalone uh, approach. They have to be used in context um, of an overall program um, that establishes uh, safe and sound banking practice. And that's what your regulators um, are, are going to be looking at when they, when they determine whether or not you're in compliance with the use of these products. Um, and I do want to take a side note here, and, and you know, most of my comments are going to be directed towards your regulated users. I know we have a lot of attendees on the call today, and thank you for joining us, that, that don't necessarily work for the institutions. Uh, but I know that you work in support of the institution, so I think it's important that you understand, um, you know, their burden and what they're going through. Um, okay, so um, main points of this, um, the evaluation program, um, that the institution maintain a criteria for the content of appraisals and evaluations consistent with safe and sound bank banking practice, and that they implement controls that promote compliance. And that includes third parties, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, third parties here in a minute. Um, transactions that require evaluations. Uh, before you can decide how and, and where you're going to use these automated tools and these AVMs, uh, you have to identify on a transactional basis uh, what transactions are actually eligible, eligible for an evaluation versus a full appraisal. Okay. And the guidance goes through and, and has Appendix A goes into a little bit of this, um, these criteria. Um, the, the most obvious one being the appraisal threshold, which is currently the 250,000 uh, de minimis level. Uh, but there are additional characteristics that they encourage the banks to consider. Uh, any characteristics which increase the risk of a particular transaction. Um, they have a, a circular logic, if you will, where, yeah, you, you know, the, the transaction may be eligible for an evaluation, but if during the course of uh, the evaluation development uh, you recognize that there's additional risk in the transaction, they encourage you to consider and have procedures and policies in place to circle back and escalate uh, back up to a full appraisal product. Um, uh, some of the things, atypical properties, some of the strengths and weaknesses that, that uh, Dave mentioned in the slide previously. Uh, if the AVM can't recognize a property's proximity to railroad tracks, for example, um, might lessen the credibility of the automated valuation. Might, doesn't necessarily, um, but the regulations encourage lenders to acknowledge, recognize that, and have uh, processes in place to circulate back to an appraisal. Um, evaluation development, um, institutions, you know, again, policy and procedure, determine the appropriate collateral valuation method for a given transaction considering the associated risks, and select the method um, appropriate, not just the highest value, lowest cost, fastest turn time. Uh, you can consider those factors, but obviously, primarily, you're interested in finding the most uh, accurate and valid credible, credible um, valuation for that transaction. So, so th again, this whole section talks about once you've determined that an evaluation is appropriate, now how do you go about determining it? Uh, very controversial piece, and uh, the uh, when the guidance was first released, a uh, topic of many much debate, and has led to definitely uh, changing the landscape dramatically in the use of these tools. Uh, there's a section in there that talks about uh, the physical condition. The valuation of the, uh, must be in the actual physical condition of the property. So the debate was, well, how do I do that? And, and, and you know, do I have to go and do a physical inspection every time? If you read the guidance carefully, uh, it does not mandate a physical inspection. Uh, it says a couple of quotes here. The valuation method should address the property's actual physical condition and characteristics, establish criteria to determine the level and extent of research to ascertain the actual physical characteristics. And you, you know, you got to figure out how far you got to go to get there. Um, but then there's another caveat at the end 
uh, that says if an institution uh, does not perform a physical inspection, you got to explain in your evaluation what you did do and and how how that equates to the actual physical condition of the property. So they've kind of left the door open for alternate solutions other than an actual physical inspection. Uh, not suggesting that a physical inspection isn't the easiest and obvious, most obvious way to get there. Um, but again, the door is open for a creative solution, and it's up to the bank um, or the institution um, to support their approach. Um, content. The uh, evaluation content, um, again, the, it's the, uh, the obvious result of the development process. Uh, estimate an actual physical condition, um, use the methods, include information. Here's another interesting point on this. Include information of the preparer when an evaluation is performed by a person. So that's a quote from there. It seems that if, if they're saying that it, when it's done by a person, are they anticipating when it's not done by a person? So I think, again, a nod to uh, some of these tools and how they um, there is an element that can be done without the uh, personal uh, personal involvement of an actual physical inspection. Third party. Third party arrangements. There's a section here, very important. Uh, overreaching talks about uh, all engagements or all arrangements with third parties and the importance and the caution of uh, using third parties. Uh, the section concludes with the institution's risk management should reflect the complexity of the outsourced activity and the associated risk. Uh, I always translate that to your oversight should be commensurate with your reliance on your third party. So if you don't have um, you know, the expertise in-house to do these kind of things, uh, make sure that your oversight is commensurate with what you're doing and, and who you're relying on. Um, so with that, you know, the good news is um, that there's, you know, we basically got the green light from the interagency guides. So there's a specific statement in there that institutions may use a variety of analytical methods and technology tools for developing an evaluation. So clearly, we're off to the races. They've acknowledged the, the validity of these tools and, uh, you know, and that they can, in fact, be used. I think it's the, the first affirmative statement. Uh, that they can be used, but of course that sentence ends with, you know, provided the institution can demonstrate the valuation method is consistent with safe and sound banking practices. So they're saying, yeah, go ahead and use them, and you're off to the races with the green light, but before you get out of the pits, the, red, the, the yellow caution flag is flying, and they're saying, yeah, you can do it, but the burden is on you to prove that how you're using them and when you're using them is actually uh, safe and sound practice. So. I want to take a, a side note here um, in, in that context, uh, safe and sound practice. Many of you submitted questions during the registration process. I want to thank you for those, and we're going to get to some more of those Q&A here later. Um, James in Denver asked a question that we get quite a bit, and it's right on point to this, to this slide. Uh, I'll paraphrase, but his question was, can you tell me what products are fully compliant for, for lending use? Um, and I'll share with you. Uh, some comments that were from the OCC's appraisal policy specialist from the PMC, the Predictive Methodologies Conference from last year, and Bob said in essence that uh, the OCC uh, doesn't label any product or tool as compliant. Uh, there's no such thing. They don't, they don't endorse any products and they won't label anything as compliant. It's how you use these tools in the context of your program that's important and that will lead to your regulator determining whether or not uh, it's compliant or not. Okay, so James, thanks for the question. I hope that answers your question. Um, so with that, uh, with the caution flag blinking, I want to uh, turn our focus now to Appendix B, uh, evaluations based on analytical methods and technological tools. And I will turn it over to our resident race car driver, uh, Lee Kennedy to walk us through that, the, that section of the guidance as well as the next series uh, of these slides. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, I consider race car uh, driving also well within the risk management confines that we all work in today. Uh, on this slide, uh, 
basically is the, the Appendix B of 2010-42 uh, is really the focus, the specific focus on uh, these, these types of analytical tools and methods. And, and what they're basically saying all the way through, and we'll get in more into the dirt of this, is that uh, you need to have, the lending institution needs to have the appropriate uh, uh, personnel on board or find the appropriate personnel or a third party to do uh, this type of uh, uh, testing and analysis and risk management that's necessary to use these tools. Um, on the next slide, it's uh, broken out into a few sections here. Um, let's take a brief look at each one of the uh, uh, of these. Selecting an AVM uh, is, and again, this is a very long section uh, in the guidance, and and I. Uh, hope that you'll all take the opportunity to go take a look at it. But basically what it says is you need to perform the uh, necessary level of due diligence on the vendors supplying the AVMs and their models. And you need to understand, uh, you know, how, how those models are developed. Uh, as a lending institution, you need to establish acceptable minimum performance criteria for the use of these models. Uh, and that can be uh, error, precision, uh, and uh, accuracy metrics around the use of these. Um, you also need to perform a detailed validation of the model uh, considered during that selection process. You need to evaluate the underlying data in the model, the data sources, frequency of updates, quality control, um, all those types of pieces uh, that go into model construction. Uh, that's on the data side. You need to assess the modeling techniques, the inherent strengths and weaknesses of the different type of modeling types, uh, such as hedonic index, the blended model, Bayesian, it goes on and on, uh, as well as how these types of modeling techniques perform for different types of uh, properties and geographies. You also need to evaluate, um, it says, the vendor scoring system and methodology, and we'll get into that a little bit later uh, into the confidence scoring aspects. It also mentions tax assessed valuations. I don't know of anybody that's still uh, utilizing uh, tax assessed valuations out there today. Um, another section of this is determining ABM use. Um, it basically what it says, an institution should establish policies and procedures for determining whether an ABM can be used. So again, it's that bump logic. Do you have a lot of risk involved in the transaction on the origination side? And basically, we're focusing on the origination side for most of this guidance. Um, you need to a uh, maintain AVM performance criteria for accuracy and reliability uh, on a transactional basis. You need to establish internal confidence score minimums or similar criteria. And we'll get into what the confidence scores actually mean. Uh, you need to establish procedures for obtaining an appraisal, in other words, bump logic to get you where you're going. Uh, and you need to identify circumstances uh, when an AVM may not be used, uh, whether you know the market conditions warrant it, you have a, a, a volatile market, whether model's performance is outside of a tolerance for, for a particular geographic market, uh, or a property is atypical, as Mike mentioned before. Um, understanding. Yeah, on this on this particular slide, understanding your products, how, why they work, and and again remembering strengths and weaknesses, in in selecting an AVM, perform the necessary level of due diligence on AVM vendors and their models, including how the model model developers conduct performance testing, uh, establish uh, acceptable minimum performance criteria for a model prior to and independent of the validation process. That's again back on the lender. Perform a detailed valuation of the models considered during the selection process. Evaluate the underlying data used in the model, including data sources, type frequency. Assess modeling techniques, inherent strengths and weaknesses. Evaluate the scoring system. Um, it's, it's stuff that we've all covered. Okay, on the next slide, determining the use of an AVM. Uh, institutions should establish policies, procedures maintain AVM performance criteria, implement controls to preclude value shopping, as Dave said earlier, uh, when more, more than one AVM is used, establish procedures for obtaining an appraisal, this goes under bump logic, or using a different value, valuation method 
uh, when an AVM's result uh, tells you not to use it. And what we always say here at uh, AV Metrics is the best thing an AVM can tell you is when not to use it. And if you understand the outputs of the AVMs, um, you, you, you'll know when it's telling you not to use it. Um, let's go on to the next slide, validating AVM results. Uh, the guidance continues on with uh, the validation can be performed internally or with the assistance of a third party as long as the validation is conducted by qualified individuals that are independent of the model development or sales function. An institution, further it goes, an institution should not rely solely upon uh, the validation represented, uh, representations provided by an ABM vendor. However, uh, there's very valuable information coming from these vendors as they're updating at, uh, their models all the time, their data sources, and their own internal testing uh, of these models is very valuable. You just can't totally rely upon it. Uh, ensure unbiased test results. Uh, you need to compare the test results of the AVMs to actual sales uh, in a specified trade area or sense. And, and that's just uh, part and parcel of the, of the basic benchmark testing process. Okay, next slide. Uh, this guidance came, came out shortly after the uh, appraisal and evaluation guidelines and is in essence a replacement for uh, OCC 2000-16, um, uh, which is way back to, so what's that, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, model validation still remains at the core of this new guidance, except this guidance has a much broader scope to it. Um, Here's some of the key sections of the guidance for the users and developers uh, that we've got up here on the slide. Uh, the, uh, the rigor and sophistication of the validation should be consummate with the bank's overall use of the models, right? I think for the mid-tier and smaller lenders uh, that you can uh, consummate with your risk all of what we're showing you here can be done in a, uh, a lesser fashion than the, you know, the Big Ten can be. Uh, validation also involves a degree of independence uh, from the model development. Uh, it you know, should be done by people who are not responsible for the development or use and don't have a stake in it. So you kind of close the loop there. Uh, I know a lot of uh, the large lending institutions that do their own validation have a separate uh, data and analytics group outside of their production uh, areas to do this validation. And again, uh, individuals doing the validation uh, need to have a degree of familiarity with how these models are being used, uh, whether it's for equity lending, uh, streamlined refinances, uh, portfolio or risk management. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different uh, servicing and, and origination verticals within the lending institutions. You need to understand how they're actually being used at that point in time. Um, another section of this, uh, this section five here is the three uh, key elements. And this is a, by the way, it's a long document, so we're just picking out a few of these, these key, key peeps, uh, key sections of it. Uh, the, uh, as part of model validation, key model assets should be subject to uh, critical analysis is basically what it's saying here. Uh, and they, they want you to take a look, again, like we talked about, what type of modeling is it, uh, what, what can the, the ABM modelers provide, uh, uh, evidence on how the model was constructed and how it's currently being updated and used. Ongoing monitor, the relevance of the data uh, uh, used to build the model uh, uh, should be evaluated to ensure that it, it's reasonable. Um, the second core element here uh, of the validation process is ongoing monitoring. Uh, and what it states is such monitoring confirms that the model is appropriately implemented, being used, and, and is performing as intended. Uh, ongoing monitoring is essential to evaluation, evaluate changes in products, exposures, activities. So they, they're saying once you put this thing in production, um, is it doing what you want it to do? And that goes to bullet point number three, where you start doing outcomes or sensitivity analysis um, uh, on, on the models that are in your production uh, suites. 
Next slide. Yep. Mike. So I know there's, you know, th this regulatory stuff can, can be dry and long, and unfortunately, there's no way to do it all justice in the small, in the short time frame we have here. Consider, if you will, that HR 4173, the Dodd Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, is on almost 2,300 page document. We've reduced it to one slide with three bullet points. Uh, so you get a feel for what we're doing. I think uh, it, the Dodd-Frank Act is going to be a, have a tremendous impact on our industry as a whole. Uh, there's some 400 rules that need to be written and implemented uh, for this act. They're only up to about 200, two and a quarter have been implemented. Um, the main ones that, that affect our topic here today, ABMs, uh, obviously the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, is going to play an important role as, a, as an oversight organization. Uh, they are working on a couple of different things. Um, the oh, the modification, I want to mention just real quickly that the modification to the uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act now requires that all valuations be delivered to the consumer, uh, would be applicant or borrower as the case may be. Uh, that now includes not just copy of their appraisal done on their transaction, but also other valuations which extend to uh, AVMs and evaluations. So keep that in mind as you uh, look at the products and, and anticipate that your, your clients, your customers, consumers are going to have to have a copy of those and likely they're going to come with a lot of questions uh, for explanation on what it is that they're reading and, and why it is that they're not happy with it. Um, also the, the mandate for the quality control, and this is something that's, that's being worked on um, right now by the CFPB. Um, that one of their representatives uh, made a statement on a very recent webinar that uh, uh, they hope to have that done within 2013, and that those quality controls, um, which are shown on the next, on this slide here, um, they hope to have those rules promulgated. They're working with the other uh, organizations as well as the appraisal foundation and the appraisal subcommittee um, to implement these quality controls. Now, a lot of these quality controls are going to hit right on the AVM modelers themselves. That's where they're intended. But again, circling back to the third-party management piece and the, and the uh, regulatory obligation that institutions have to understand what their vendors uh, and modelers are doing and these tools they're using, they're going to need to be familiar with those quality control standards. Okay. Um, again, we're running a little bit long, as David mentioned earlier in here, so we're going to bring this around to, to some of the final turns here and accelerate towards the finish line. Um, this is a summary slide of the regulatory expectations. Again, we've covered a lot of this material, um, oversight and model, uh, model risk, treated as any other risk, uh, includes rigorous and independent testing and validation of, uh, prior to implementation. We put that prior to implementation. Keep in mind as you read through these guidance, uh, the regulators do care about the sequence of events and how you address these things. So. Uh, you know, establish your risk tolerance first, Estet, you know, then identify some candidate models, and then go into your model validation process. Uh, and that last bullet point, explain, document everything you can. Again, the burden of uh, compliance is on the institution to justify how and what you're doing and that your comprehensive, holistic program uh, results in effective, safe, and sound practice. Okay. So again, so now we want to turn our attention to this checkpoint, uh, the, the five-point checklist uh, that we promised you. These are some of the topics that we've covered here today, but uh, more poignantly in an action item sort of an approach. Okay. So first item is to know the rules. You know, understand that guidance. Uh, develop your policies and procedures. Use the policies and procedures as a template. If you don't have your PMPs in place, use that guidance to reverse engineer it. If you do have policies and procedures in place, go through those item by item. Try to tie them to uh, the policy and procedure bullet points uh, that you feel justify um, what you're doing. And again, make it easy on your regulator to come in and uh, connect the dots so that uh, you get a satisfactory result. Okay? Do it as look at it as a program, you know, not as snapshots. There's a quote there on the slide. Uh, right out of uh, the summary of the guidance, examiners will review the institution's policies, procedures, internal controls. Okay. Um, 
Uh, item number two, the next one, understand your vendors and products and questionnaires. This is about third-party oversight. It's also about your knowledge and understanding of the products and tools that you're implementing in your program. Um, platform access, um, you know, how, how, how it is that you're gaining access to your AVMs and your technology tools. Who are the providers that you're relying on? Um, use the RFI RFP process to develop cr uh, criteria and characteristics of what it is you're trying to achieve. And then use uh, questionnaires. Um, the single model approach, uh, Dave covered that earlier. Uh, much more uh, common to use a cascade or a model preference table solution um, than a single model approach. But again, uh, establish your criteria for tolerance first, then exercise that. Um, one of the things that we recommend um, is to, the use of questionnaires. Um, it'll get you a lot of the questions that were submitted um, in, the, in the registration process earlier um, can be solved using this particular approach. Um, general questions on, on the AVMs, the developers, the, the models themselves. Uh, data specific questions. One of the questions that was asked in registration was you know, how reliable is the data that's used in a typical AVM? Um, that's a great question um, to ask of your vendor. Uh, you know, the generic question is that it, it, it's as good as the supplier or the source of information that's being used. You know, and that varies from model to model. So I encourage any individual user, uh, it may be different from uh, you may be, find it reliable in your institution while another institution may not find it reliable to their risk tolerance and their standards. Um, hey Mike, and this so is David, one thing, one thing. One thing to quickly well, add there, that as the data comes in, each data provider is going to go through its own cleaning process. And so you'll want to talk to the different AVM, I'm sorry, the AVM companies to understand what their process is when they receive the data, how they clean it, and how it makes it into the database. So sorry, I just want to add that. That's, that's a great point, David. And you know, it, it's, it, it runs the whole gamut of, you know, some, some AVM people have their own data and they feel it's nice and clean, and other people take a look at that same data and say, hey, well, I'm going to clean it up some more and use it in my model. It's all in how they use that information, and it's important for uh, the institutions and the end users um, to acknowledge that. Great point, Dave. Um, Dave, let me turn this next slide over to you um, on the do's and don'ts. I mentioned, the, as you did earlier, about uh, the cascade approach being uh, more common than single model approach currently, and we've got some uh, do's and don'ts here. Sure, and this is just to quickly summarize. Everything that was just described by Mike and Lee gets into spe the specifics and what the examiners and regulators are looking for. So here's just a quick summary. So we'll start with the don'ts. Uh, you don't want a value shop. That's bad for obvious reasons. And a quick definition of value shop, if you're pulling multiple AVMs looking for a value, that's obviously not the right risk approach. So you want to stay away from that. That's not real common today. Uh, it may have been in the years past, but today that doesn't seem to be a big problem. The second item seems to come up more often than, than others, though, is to defer to a biased party, a AVM developer. So right now, as we've discussed, AVM cascades and going through this testing procedure and, and, and understanding which, a which AVM goes in what position. Um, what you want to make sure is that you're talking to the AVM providers for obvious reasons. But you also have some kind of understanding, whether that's your own internal expertise and the individuals that are familiar with AVMs and know what the process is, or you go to somebody like a third party independent party that is independent and has this experience as well. Because I can tell you, I'm an AVM developer. I would love to have my AVM used as a single model approach or at least at the front of every <laughs> AVM cascade across the country. But you know, I'm biased. Every developer is going to be biased. And so that's not the idea here. The idea is to have it a transparent approach in which AVMs are tested and then rules are set up about the use of those AVMs. And if you, if you have one AVM developer that's providing the test, test data and then providing the benchmarks or the values that be, they're going to be compared against and then doing the analysis and then ultimately setting up the cascade or that preference table, there's going to be some influence there, especially whether it's their own AVM cascade or maybe there's margins involved with a, uh, other AVMs. So just keep that in mind. You want to make sure that ultimately, since you, since you are ultimately responsible for it, you have to understand how the AVMs are being tested. You need to be able to, to talk to those items and then ultimately how that cascade or preference table is going to get implemented. So as you go through that list, don't, that goes back into don't blindly trust the rules that you provide to somebody else has even taken place. So that goes back to what Lee was talking about, monitor at the end of each month. If you expect a certain ratio or a certain number of AVMs coming from a provider, you want to make sure you're seeing those same ratios in production. 
And then uh, the final don't, don't give up on AVMs because that takes us down to, to the uh, items below. <laughs> you want to understand your footprint. You want to ask the questions. You want to get your hands on the data. Check the math. Trust and verify. Make sure that, uh, that uh, what you think is going into production is actually going into production. And then ultimately, keep in mind that AVMs are great tools. So you want to use them as often as possible. They're much too accurate and efficient and cost effective to simply ignore it simply because that's what the industry is using these days. So understand their application and just when to do it. So that's a quick do's and don't list. Thanks, David. A lot of those comments uh, apply to, to item three as well, which is to adopt a reliance on, on independent testing. Again, the, the, regula the regulatory um, oversight bodies are, are looking for that independence and that there's, um, the interest is focused on a best performing model approach um, not just you know your hit rates and you know getting a value um, again to the, do, to the don't slide the value shopping um, appendix B again you know this third party stuff and, and some of you may look at this and you, you know that AV metrics is a, is a testing company and it's a, a blatant commercial but hey if you don't have the this expertise in-house if you need some level of help or if you want to rely um, you know find a company like AV metrics that can help you we're here um, but there's a lot of help out there. So your modelers uh, can be a great source of information and, and other folks as well. Benchmark testing, I want to run through that really fast because, you know, benchmark testing is a critical process. It deserves a heck of a lot more time than we have here yeah, today. It's normally it, a whole day. Yeah, it, it in itself is a webinar, and we can get to that. But check the guidance. Check, check uh, uh, 2011-12 about model guidance and then check the rest of the stuff. Yeah, what, what I'd say on this is this is really almost a to-do list for your policies and procedures. Uh, all this, all, all of these questions need to be asked and answered into the lending institution's policies and procedures as, as part of that. So, yeah, great question to ask. Uh, and this is the the ongoing part of that. This is the statistical analysis of once you've gathered your your sample data. Um, relative, uh, one comment I would make about this is, you know, the thing that the regulators are looking for is your, your sample data is reflective of your use of these models. So don't rely on national statistics or national uh, test results if you are a regional uh, lender, a regional player, um, if you, you know, focus on a particular type of property or in a particular um, market tier, if you, you specialize to first-time home buyers. Make sure that your sampling and your analysis is reflective of your intended use of the tools. Yeah, I'd go a little bit on this just to give you a flavor for what goes into uh, the the analysis. It, some pretty powerful statistical packages are used on in, in the testing uh, that take a, a specific looks at precision, accuracy, error. Uh, the measurements include mean and median, standard deviation, RMS, on and on and on. Uh, there's also some uh, specific uh, measurements that, that we look at. Uh, accuracy within 10, or what they call PPE 10 and 20 of the benchmark. Errors greater than 20% uh, on both right and left tail error uh, sides of the model. Uh, and uh, there's also many other testing segmentations, including price tier analysis, as Dave said earlier, property type analysis, segmentation of the confidence scores and FSDs. Um, on the confidence scoring methods, there's just so many out there. They vary in type alpha, numeric, and scale. Um, the reason, reason why that is is because these models have been being developed over a long period of time, and each one of the modelers had their, their really their own view of uh, error, or precision, or accuracy to develop those with. Um, the big question, is there a correlation to predictive value? Absolutely. Some of the models are uh, have a very high correlation or strong correlation, and other models not so much. And, and that's some of the measurement processes that you take a look at in uh, in, in the testing processes. Uh, standardizing the confidence score, yeah. Over the last uh, couple of years, there's been some movement in that direction. Uh, it's called forecast standard deviation, first introduced by Freddie Mac to their home value explorer model. So again, just running through this quickly. Go ahead, Dave. I think you have the next slide. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, um, 
basically the idea is to have a plan to know when and where to use the AVMs. So if you have a plan and you have a use of guardrails, for lack of a better term, you're going to stay within those guardrails, make sure that you um, use them in an appropriate manner. And uh, as always, uh, one thing to identify here, the middle of the page, uh, is talking about the guidelines. The guidelines are great for AVMs because specifically they address that AVMs are real, prop or real products that have a real application. And so it's not saying don't use AVMs, it's just simply saying understand what you're using. But it's saying the same thing for appraisals and other valuation approaches as well. So you go into the next slide, and uh, we're just going to spend a, a second or two on each of these following slides just because uh, um, we've talked about most of these items already. But if you take this, uh, this deck back and go through these slides, uh, uh, you can ask yourself some of these same questions. When do I need to verify actual current physical condition? How do I verify condition? what are acceptable proxies, so on and so forth. So again, those specific questions aren't directly answered within the guidelines, um, but there, it, it's definitely a conversation that needs to be had. What's comfortable, what's the risk tolerance, and, and what are you going to do to go through and verify the physical condition of a property when an AVM is, is in use? David, okay, can so I add next slide, fine. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, David, just want to add to that a little bit. Uh, in, in dealing with our client base on this, what what we recommend is, you know, these are these are questions generated by the language that weren't specifically answered in the guidance. Go to your primary federal regulator. Uh, these are still open to interpretation, and ask them based on your program what can you do, right? Uh, can we take this approach? Can we take that approach? And what we find across you know uh, 40 or 50 different clients is. Each one of them has a different answer from their primary federal regulator on these questions. So it, it challenge your regulator in these areas uh, with your business processes. Good point. OK, we're on the final two slides. Um, this is ultimately just saying uh, take responsibility. We, this has been uh, reiterated over and over throughout this uh, discussion. Um, it's probably a, an uncomfortable picture to look at but with a dog right there. But the idea is um, <laughs> to make sure from a responsibility standpoint that uh, you know what's taking place. If you're uh, purchasing these products, that uh, you know where you get them from and they're tested and that's the right tool for the right situation. And then finally, the last slide is the... Uh, to review the checklist, uh, we don't have time to go through each bullet point, but I encourage you to print this out and go through and ask yourself uh, these questions. Talk to your vendors about that. Talk to the independent testing agencies and make sure you're comfortable and then move forward. Okay, so uh, this is Beverly. I'm back now. We're going to start our question and answer session. I just wanted to let you know that um, all of our attendees, we're going to be sending you the PowerPoint presentation. And we're also going to be sending you a link to a recording for the webinar. So if there's anything that you missed or if you wanted to keep the slides and review them again, you'll be able to do that. Um, you should have them by tomorrow. So we'll have it all out to you by tomorrow. Um, we are almost out of time, so we only have time for a few questions. However, if you have questions, please submit them through the question uh, feature on your, your GoToWebinar screen. And uh, if we don't get to the question, someone from Vero's or AV Metrics, I'm sorry, AV Metrics, will get back to you uh, within a few days to answer your question. So just because we don't answer it today doesn't mean that you won't get an answer to your question. We just have a lot of questions and we don't have a lot of time left. Okay, so our first question comes from Paul from California. And the question is, when looking at AVM cascades versus single models, which is most consistent and accurate at evaluating valuation risk and fraud? Uh, well, Lee, why don't you take the first stab at that, and I'll follow you up. Well, it, it, the, the cascades or model preference tables um, versus a single model. Here's what we found in, in testing since about the year 2000 is, uh, models have strengths and weaknesses based on geography, uh, as well as property type, price tier, and, and such. And you're from California, you, you understand uh, how much that changes in a very uh, you know, small geographic area. So by the use of a model preference table, uh, these models are tuned differently, some for high value properties, some for conforming properties, uh, some for condominiums. The use of a model preference table will allow you to choose from over 20-some models 
to your specific needs, geography, property type. So the use of the, the uh, model preference table or cascade is, is what we see as one of the best ways to, to mitigate uh, that risk by having a, a truly high-performing model for that specific property. I agree. The only the only thing I the only thing I'd add there is um, you know you have small you have certain lenders that have a small geographic area. If they have the time and the expertise, they may be able to look at a specific model or do multiple tests with uh, with different models. And if uh, again if their volumes uh, you know appropriate and they feel comfortable with one model, that'd probably be one of the few areas where it would be appropriate to use a single model. Okay. Great. All right, our next question comes from Tony from New York. What do you expect will come next from the CFPB or others on AVM regulations? I think next from CFPB, uh, they, they've got their hands full with this quality control on AVMs, and, and uh, Bill has uh, said that that's going to be their priority for 2013, and they want to get that behind them. Um, you know, the CFPB and the implementation of Dodd-Frank and, again, those the balance of those 400-some-odd rules, um, there's a lot coming. There's a lot coming that's going to change the landscape um, for the industry. Um, specific to AVMs, um, hard to say. Um, you know, some, some risk management stuff will probably uh, indirectly affect uh, how these tools are used and implemented, um, but that has kind of yet to be seen. The crystal ball is still a little fuzzy for me. And Mike, you were talking earlier about how this may affect the AVM developers, the manufacturers themselves. And um, you know, for the most part, the, the, the strong AVMs that are in the marketplace right now have some pretty consistent um, uh, service levels and other uh, due diligence practices in place. So I think uh, there might be more documentation, there might be more um, uh, details provided or required of the, of the vendors of the developers themselves to provide that, but uh, I, I think we're all in a position that we can do that if we're not already doing that right now. And I, and I think the intended consequence directly from that is going to be more transparency to end users. Um, and to get off a little bit, I know one of the other uh, questions that was asked for, uh, early on was you know, about, the, about uh, the old black box thing. Um, there, I don't think there's any such thing as a black box when you get to you know, working with a vendor, but um, you know, there's definitely going to uh, be some transparency that results from this um, for for all of the you know not just the industry users but you know the consumers um, who the bureau is in, in uh, entrusted to protect. All right, we have our next question from Joanne from Connecticut. What is your recommendation for how to vet a third party if expertise isn't in house? Well, we covered a little bit of that on, on the bullet point number two. Um, we, I, I really encourage the use of um, you know, the request for information, request for proposal approaches, and using questionnaires. Um, you know, develop in-house the information that you feel you need to know in accordance to the guidance, and um, just ask your vendors that information. How do, you, how do you, you know, get the best qualified person to help you solve your problem? Yeah, there's also uh, publications out there and organizations. Uh, Collateral Assessment Technology Committee has developed some best practices. There's uh, two publications, AVM 101 and AVMs 201, that have a lot of that uh, reference question and uh, third-party validation material involved in that as well. All right, we have time for two more questions. So the next question is from Darren from Arizona. The term guidance gets used a lot. How do I know what is really a rule and what is going to be enforced? <laughs> uh, See your primary federal. Yeah, manager. that's a great question, Darren. I'll give you the I'll give you the good news, bad news answer. Right, uh, uh, the guidance is written, I believe, intentionally in gray language uh, to allow for flexibility in solutions. Right. Uh, the bad news is that they're not going to give you a black and white answer to your question, and the good news is they're not going to give you a black and white answer to your question. Um, it leaves much of the guidance that suggests that it's up to the individual institution to define for themselves, you know, what that answer is, and then implement a solution to get to that answer. Um, and again, the context of your program, so how you use these tools or other tools, um, will eventually result in compliance or non-compliance. Um, but they, you know, they want to give you some flexibility to, 
you know, what's the old saying, there's more than one way to skin a cat? So have at it. Okay, and our last question is from James from Illinois. How open should I expect an ABM vendor to be during testing? So I know I'm doing my due diligence for regulators. And where is the proprietary line drawn? Well, from the ABM vendor, yeah, from a vendor's perspective, we're happy to pass that information over. So as Mike said uh, a few times already, there's questionnaires and other things. So uh, we, there's samples of questionnaires that are available to get into specifically, you know, how the, the, the values are being generated, where's the data sources, how often is it updated, um, those, that, those kind of detail information, which you have to have a basic understanding for. But then you have to go through that testing process, provide, whether the lender has this data, uh, this, these properties to test themselves, or if they need to go out to another source to, to obtain those. Another way to do that is over multiple months. Uh, you don't have to do it all in one given, at one given time. You can spread this testing out as well. But you want to go through that process. You want to get these values back from the uh, AVM providers. You want to know, know what that benchmark is. You want to do the, do the math to make sure you understand where it is. And then break it down by vendor and then go into your uh, cascading rules and, and preference tables as well. But from a vendor standpoint, to go back to the original question, we're happy to go through that, that process, whether it be our data, whether it be our valuation process, whether it's coming on site to see the facilities, uh, meet some of the uh, programmers, those kind of things. It should be pretty transparent, and that's the idea. Okay, well, that would be, that concludes today's webinar. So thank you for attending. I'd like to thank all the attendees and, of course, today's presenters, Lee Kennedy, David Rasmussen, and Michael Coyne. If you've had any questions that you have not had answered or if you have, think of a question in an hour or so after the webinar and you go, oh, crap, I didn't ask that question, you have their email addresses on the screen right now. So um, you can contact any of our presenters today and um, you'll be able to ask them any questions you need. Um, you can also feel free to email us at National Mortgage Professional and we'll get the, uh, the message along to them. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for attending and everyone for presenting. We had a great uh, informative webinar today and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. <laughs>